Um, I'm really excited for this next talk. Uh, Nicole Hoffman uh, comes with to us with a great experience in a lot of fraud identification, fraud research and uh, investigation. And uh, the reason I'm so excited about this is, is uh, an area that I've worked in extensively and I had a little bit of a sneak preview on, on your slides, Nicole, and uh, I'm really, really pumped for what you'll be uh, what you'll be presenting. Um, and I don't want to steal your thunder at all, but uh, I'm I'm this is an area where I think a lot of people need to focus on for a couple of reasons. Even if you're not doing fraud investigations on a daily basis, we see this kind of proliferation of capabilities. And you see what we tend to see is initially you've got state level adversaries, the cream of the crop, the well funded, and their capabilities are eventually going to kind of percolate down, or as I said, proliferate into the organized crime area where we see a lot of fraud work. Um, and then you start to see that proliferate even further into a more commoditized capability. So if you're looking at the what I like to call the bargain basement threat actors, they're going to be using in a, a month or maybe a year what's in the organized crime area right now. If you're looking instead at the state level adversaries, what you're seeing is going to eventually become this organized crime kind of capability. So the fraud becomes this middle ground where you see a lot of this, this capability. So. I like to. I wanted to frame up your your talk in that regard because even if it's not someone who's working with law enforcement or with fraud investigations, there really is this nexus between where a lot of us are working as well. So I'm super excited for your perspective on this, and uh, and I'm glad you can join us. So without any further uh, delay, uh, Nicole, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so I am going to be presenting on applying fraud detection techniques to hunt adversaries. Um, like Phil had stated, I am going to be talking a good amount about uh, my life as a fraud analyst as well as fraud detection, but it is first and foremost a hunting story. So if you're interested in, you know, some uh, hunting story that's a bit different than your typical cyber hunting, definitely stick around. So a little bit about me. Um, I am currently a cyber threat intelligence analyst, or I would like to be due to the pandemic. I am looking for op new opportunities. I've been actively in the field for about three years. I did uh, recently start a blog, threathuntergirl.com, if you're interested. I was a fraud analyst before moving into information security. Um, I'm morally obligated to tell you within the first five minutes of meeting you that I am a CrossFitter, so you're welcome. And I really love being outdoors with my kids and kayaking. Um, I'm a massive Marvel and DC fan, as you can tell. Um, I can't choose between the two universes. I just love them too much. So we have a lot to go over in a short period of time. So I'm just going to get right into the agenda. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of some things that you need to know to understand uh, check fraud, which I'm going to be discussing. Then I'm going to go over the hunting experience that I had as a financial uh, analyst. And then I'm going to try to apply those lessons to the cyber domain. And just as a note, anytime I mention the name Carol, she's the adversary in the financial crime uh, story. It was just easier to identify a name instead of saying this person and that person. So Carol is always evil, just a fictional name that I made up. So a lot of people don't know the path that a check takes after it's deposited into the bank. And it's something that I wanted to discuss before I got into my presentation because it's something that adversaries take advantage of. So I don't know about you, but when I was a little girl, every Christmas, my grandma used to put a $5 check into my stocking. Never changed the amount, always $5. So in this scenario, uh, my grandma would be the payer as the writer of the check and I would be the payee as the receiver of the check. I would deposit the check into my bank. The bank would then process the check and, and send it to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve would process it and then request the funds from my grandma, the payer's account. Her bank would then process that request and send the funds back through the Federal Reserve. Once it's processed in the Federal Reserve, the funds would be sent back to my bank. In the event that she doesn't have the funds in her account, they would send that message back through the Federal Reserve. So either way, it still has to go through the Federal Reserve. And this process or this time period is known as the float. And this is something that adversaries take advantage of. And it's basically the time period of when I deposit a check and when that check either bounces or I get the funds from my grandma's account back into my account. 
Um, so that's something I want you guys to be aware of. So picture this, you're a fraud analyst, your department is super overwhelmed, you have very little resources, you're over, or understaffed um, and inundated with alerts. Does that sound familiar? It's very similar to the life as a, a cybersecurity analyst or, or even an engineer. So because my department was understaffed, I wore a lot of hats. So half my day was spent manually reviewing every check that was deposited into the organization. The reason that they had the fraud department doing this is, is because it allowed us to be in the weeds and, and seeing the fraud as it happened and putting a stop to it. But it was very, very exhausting because you, you, know, you only have a few seconds on each check because on a typical day you have thousands of checks and you have to determine is this check a fraudulent check? Is it a real check? Is it a forged signature? Uh, is this person potentially trying to commit some kind of uh, financial crime, such as like check hiding? Um, or do I just need to place this check on hold to cover that float time so that the individual who deposited the check doesn't get a loss as well as the financial institution? So after I spent all that time on that, I have to go into reviewing my fraud uh, alerts and I have to use the same due diligence or at least I try to um, reviewing all the fraud alerts and I just felt like there was so many false positives that I was chasing and I had to manually validate each one even though a lot of them I can tell just by looking at them that they were false positives I still had to validate them so when I did find an actual fraud event, it was actually really exciting because I felt like this is the job that I was trained to do. And, and now I actually get to go through, you know, the procedures of, you know, stopping the fraud alert. And I just thought this, this something has to change because I know that there's fraud going on and I know how they're doing it, but I'm so busy with all of these alerts that I can't, do anything about it. So I decided to change things up a little bit. I decided let's just focus on one thing. One thing that we know happens every day that we identify typically when we're reviewing checks, but it's not necessarily something that we're actively looking for. So I decided to make a hypothesis and start very small and say, you know, adversaries might be check hiding in my environment. So bringing Carol into the story, let's say Carol has a bank account at both bank A and bank B. She has zero dollars in both accounts, but she decides she's going to write a check from bank A for $200 and deposit it into bank B, typically through the ATM. Her bank account would then immediately show the $200 that she just deposited, and then she will take cash out at the ATM and she gets away with the money. The reason that she's able to do this is because in the United States in 1987, they um, enacted the, uh, the Expedited Funds Availability Act. And what this states is that financial institutions have to make the first $200 of checks available immediately or the next business day, depending on the financial institution. And so you typically see a lot of check hiding activities in that $200 increment. And for this example, I chose two different banks, which is what a lot of individuals will do. But in my organization, the story that I'm going to be discussing in just a bit, uh, Carol used several accounts within the same organization. And I wanted to mention one of the greatest examples of check hiding that I have ever seen is if you've ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, it's uh, based upon Frank Abagnale Jr.'s uh, life. Uh, he is a master of deception. He actually co-authored the book, as well as many others that I highly recommend. And he, at 16, he started uh, basically socially engineering the bank tellers to cash his checks. And he started printing his own checks. Then he started creating identities to go with his checks. And it was just really interesting to see how he accomplished all that as a, a kid, really. So if you haven't heard of him, I highly recommend uh, looking him up. So I wanted to start gathering all the information that I had on um, Carol and, and, and her shenanigans. And so I knew that she's typically doing it in $200 increments. I knew that she 
um, typically use as an ATM. But then I started thinking, you know, how would I do it if I was going to check Kite against my organization, given my knowledge of the environment? And my coworkers were like, yeah, but like Carol's not going to know that because she doesn't know that we do that and this. I'm like, yeah, but what if she did? Like, what if Carol works here? What if Carol is a former employee? What if she's working with an employee? And so I think it's just as important when you're trying to cultivate that adversarial mindset to look at your own knowledge of your, the inner workings of your organization, as well as, you know, what has Carol been doing in previous incidents? And, you know, what is she doing in the wild? Um, so we started collecting that information that we could use uh, to hunt in our environment. So the, those are the things that we used to query basically our data set to be able to get the information or the events uh, that were hopefully true fraud check kiting events. Um, and we found a good amount of events that were actually true fraud and it was very exciting. And as we started going through this process, I uh, noticed that there was more things that we can add to our search to expand it. I noticed there uh, are patterns that I noticed. I noticed there's a specific age group that was more popular with this financial crime. I noticed that uh, a lot of the individuals are using newer accounts or temporary checks to, to do this. Um, so I used all that information, I documented it, and I expanded the search. And what I found was a, a good amount of, of individuals that may have been working together. So I decided to make uh, spreadsheets on each person. And personally, I just used Excel. I didn't have a lot of fancy tools. And I just wrote, you know, who's writing a check to who, um, which checks were bounced, which ones were at the ATM, any information that I can use to see is if anyone is connected and put potentially working together, or if someone is using someone without their knowledge. Um, but the spreadsheets became overwhelming. So I really wanted to visualize the data. And there's also a lot of visualization tools available. Um, I was thick in the hunt at this point. I didn't want to lose traction. So my team and I just got out a piece of paper and we were just manually drawing something similar to what you see on the screen. Um, and what we found was a group of about 35 individuals that were check kiting. It was a fraud ring. Um, they were all working, it seemed like, with Carol right at the center. And we were able to uh, shut that down, close their accounts, and hand that information over to law enforcement. And what I found out when I was doing that, I was like, man, this was so easy because we weren't using extra resources. We weren't using new tools. This is just all information that we had from previous incidents, you know, like th just from our own experiences in our organization. I thought, <laughs> you know, we could have been doing this the whole time. Um, and the, the information that I used to create my hypothesis was from previous incidents. And so I just thought, you know, there's got to be a way to, you know, automate some of this. But then I realized some of it can be automated, whereas like we can update our rule sets and, and things like that to, to be able to inform us of the things that we learn, you know, like the $200 increments and things like that. But then I realized as we were going through our hunt, there was just too much like lateral thinking that we had to do. So automation is an aid, but it can never replace human driven analysis because you have to be thinking of the bigger picture um, because I wasn't hunting in like a simulated environment. I was hunting actively in our environment and this was going on and I need to put a stop to it. So I had to just, you know, look at the bigger picture and make sure that I don't miss any detail or who's involved to make sure that all the accounts get shut down. So because my hypothesis came from previous incidents, um, my final lesson is I, I can't stress enough how important it is to go back and, and um, review or analyze previous incidents that are actually true fraud. Um, I looked for anything that could have led to earlier detection, any red flag. Um, I looked, what I found, um, a lot of the individuals were repeat offenders. Um, specifically, Carol, she started um, uh, evolving her techniques over time. 
and she started uh, printing her own checks that weren't that great. And then she started using temporary checks to purchasing checks to, to altering purchase checks. And her amounts changed and it seemed like she used different techniques and we're really testing our defenses. Um, so it didn't seem like she was working with anyone on the inside. Um, so that was all very useful information. And specifically with, with her infrastructure, not so much in uh, check hiding is it excessively important, um, but for like a credit card hunt, if I'm looking for someone that's committing credit card fraud and they have, let's say like a skimmer or uh, a card printer to be able to print uh, fraudulent cards, all that information um, is extremely useful because you can't defend against um, an adversary if you don't know, you know, what, what they have, what their infrastructure is. So I try to document that as much as possible so that we can heighten our defenses in preparation for that. So when I moved into cybersecurity officially, I realized a lot of the lessons that I learned um, can be applied to hunting uh, cyber adversaries. So once again, let's try to apply this to cybersecurity. Um, I'm still learning as the threat hunter in cybersecurity, but what I try to do is mostly simulated um, environments that I, I, I typically, if I find something that I want to threat hunt for, I'll try to replicate it, create an analytic um, so that's repeatable. So one thing that I know is, uh, happens a lot is adversaries will typically hide macros within phishing attachments. And you can even go more specific, such as like a, a PowerShell. Um, you want to make sure that your hypotheses are not too general because you it, it just becomes overwhelming you want to start small look for a single uh, technique that adversaries are using and remember when you're cultivating an adversarial mindset and create trying to think of all the things that you need um, before you start hunting you want to remember not only to think about what carol might know about your organization uh, and you know based upon previous incidents, you know, if someone's been testing your defenses, um, what information could they possibly have found out? Could they have used previous versions of Microsoft Office tools? Um, all very important, as well as what is, you know, what is Carol's shenanigans outside the organization? What has she been doing in the wild? If you see, um, if your hypothesis isn't created from like previous incidents and you just think like, hey, there's this new threat group, um, I think they might be targeting our organization and you want to specifically hunt for, you know, some of their techniques, you know, definitely what I like to, I like to utilize the MITRE attack uh, knowledge base and you can go and look at uh, all of that because it's freely available and see, you know, if you're using the, you can use the cyber analytics repository or you can just look at the techniques and try to replicate them. Um, and then if, Carol is an uh, insider. You also have to think, you know, she might be aware of uh, the organization's macro policies or the, you know, how to craft an email that will most likely be opened uh, by someone in your organization. And you don't want to assume, you know, if someone in your organization is involved, it, they might not be involved voluntarily. They might be, uh, you know, unaware, uh, or they might be actively doing it. So you just have to keep all of those things in mind when you're hunting. And you can also use like two different, um, you can do like two different hunts. Like if you have all this information that is insider information, you could do like an insider hunt for this technique, given the knowledge that you have of, your, of the inner workings. And then, you know, based on external resources or previous incidents and, and look for those types of techniques. So in the event you are utilizing, like I said, an external uh, threat group or uh, a technique that's being used, um, you can utilize the attack navigator, whether it's something that is already in the MITRE attack knowledge base, or if you need to create a new um, uh, adversary profile based upon you know, something that you're seeing in your environment or something that may not be in the knowledge base, you can use a blank uh, uh, layer of the navigator that's available on uh, the attack website. Um, if you're not comfortable with the attack navigator, um, I know it's changed a lot, 
Um, you can also just use spreadsheets. I personally feel like there's nothing Excel can't do. Um, so when you're creating your processes in cybersecurity, I find that it's a, a lot uh, more important to document it. Um, personally, I have ADHD and I forget everything if I don't write it down. So I have to be able to remember um, certain analytics that I create, certain filters that I create. So I try to document all of it. There's certain times when you have to filter out certain parent processes and, and, and so on because it's, you know, if it's a system account, if you're, once you start going in and, and, and hunting for things and the logs, you'll start to identify little tricks and, and whatnot. And I like to save all of my queries and filters that I find useful because if it's not useful for, it's, well, it's going to be useful for you in the future, I promise. But if you're working with a team of hunters, it will most likely be useful for them too, to be able to just go through it really quickly. Um, for visualization, um, if you don't wanna use my old school method <laughs> of writing it out on a piece of paper, I personally love using uh, the MISP um, project. It is an open source project. Um, I have an example from the MISP project of their correlation graph. Um, and the MISP can be used for um, multiple different industries. Um, we actually used it um, in uh, the financial institution eventually. Um, we implemented it. So you can do all sorts of indicators. You can create your own graphs. And the one thing I like about it the most is it has an automatic correlation engine on the back end. So it'll actually correlate the things, the indicators that are matching from different events. Um, and so I, I personally really love it because it's really easy to use, really easy to deploy, and it's open source. So it, it doesn't require a whole lot. And then if you're not um, actively uh, working on incident response, or if like say you're creating an analytic and then handing it over to another team for them to use, um, try to get as much information back from that team, such as, you know, if, such as incident response. Try to, to allow them to inform you of, you know, the kinds of techniques that they're seeing, what's evading detection, um, all that information, because it's going to be useful for you um, going into your hunt. And if you do, while you're hunting, if you are hunting in an active environment, try to identify the types of um, techniques that are happen. Try to analyze the behaviors leading up to detection. See if you can identify anything that can heighten your security controls to be able to detect it sooner. Anything about the adversary's infrastructure you know, is very important because if you're getting, you know, hit with a nation state or, you know, you want to be able to identify what does their infrastructure look like? What are their resources? Is this possibly a team of people? Is this a script kitty? All very important things to document that can help you um, with future hunts. So just to review, um, if I didn't say my lessons enough, when you're getting into hunting, um, focus on one thing, start small, create a hypothesis, try to make it as specific as possible. And while you're creating your hypothesis and, and going through creating your analytics, you might find, you might, you know, get ideas for future hunts, but try not to get scope creep and just, you know, document that for future hunts. Um, you don't want to chase the shiny things. Um, and then when you're cultivating an adversarial mindset, just remember it's 50-50, 50% your knowledge of the inner workings of your organization, as well as, you know, what is Carol doing, uh, what your assumptions are uh, of their knowledge of your environment. And then document everything. It's extremely useful, especially if you're working with law enforcement. And visualize your findings. This isn't for everyone, but I personally like to visualize data so that I can analyze it better. And then don't forget to, you know, analyze the behaviors uh, of an incident and, and identify um, anything that could lead to earlier detection or anything that you can take that's actionable for your team to be able to prevent this in the future. So I hope you liked my presentation. Um, thank you all for joining me today. I know I'm honored to be here.